And I think, you know, there's there's always these conversations about whether design thinking is good or bad or, you know, you see these medium articles about it or whatever. And it's just like, I think it's just the wrong conversation. It's not yeah. whether it's good or bad. It's just, it's an additional toolkit. You know, it's an additional tool in your kit of things as a designer that, that you can use to help create these experiences. That's essentially what it is. It's a framework for creation. Mm -hmm. Less of someone else taking your job away. Welcome to Design Drives, your audio experience about what, how, and why design drives things forward. A podcast hosted by Sebastian Gear, together with forward-thinking design practitioners from around the world. In this episode, I talk with Rob Harrigan doing Interaction 20 in Milan. Based on his experiences working at IBM as a creative director, as well as being active in New York's design scene for quite a while, we talk about how the power of design visualization can drive transparency of knowledge and accelerate the communication of innovations. In the episode, we touch on the increasing role of AI and the complexity to incorporate it into the design process, but also the opportunities for it, his personal design process and journey, but also why, how and what design drives forward. Enjoy the episode. Hi Rob, thanks for taking time. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. So you are design principal uh, for immersive design and IS services at IBM in New York. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, your job there, your role, and a little bit also about um, your past working on that area, uh, working with AI and data. Um, so maybe for the audience, it would be great if you could give them a little run through to your journey and some of the experiences in the past. Sure. As you just said, I'm, I'm currently at IBM. I lead, you know, our immersive experience design team as well as um, AI services. Uh, so that runs the gamut from the client experience centers where we teach clients about um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, things that are hard to comprehend. Uh, we tell stories using a uh, 290 degree immersive room to demonstrate uh, artificial intelligence um, at scale. So basically can visualize the amount of data that an AI system can understand that humans can't and help them uh, comprehend what it's doing and understand you know, how it's making decisions and why it's making decisions, et cetera. And before that, uh, I worked at Ogilvy uh, in a traditional creative agency role and, and focused a lot on branding and, and, and visual design and worked at a financial startup called Liquinet a long time ago and just kind of freelanced all around town, Disney, Nickelodeon, uh, et cetera. So it's been about 15 years, of five years at Ogilvy, five years at IBM, so now. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly in New York, right? Yep, always in New York. Yeah, I mean, it's a great place for design, right? It is. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a constantly bustling hub. I don't know if it's as good as Milan, but yeah. it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. So when you were saying immersive experiences uh, or immersive design, um, so you said like 360 degree, so visualizing data, or can you maybe extend that a little bit or uh, outline sure. that a little bit? Like, what do you mean with that? Um, so, it, um, you know, we'll, we'll take, for example, uh, a, a Watson product. So if I pluck something out of the air, like a financial services product, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a financial service analyst's job is to investigate alerts. Even at a small bank, there'll be thousands and thousands of alerts they have to look at. That will take them anywhere from three hours to three days, depending on the severity or complexity of it. Um, the Watson product uses publicly available data as well as uh, institutional data mm -hmm. um, to help identify, I guess, activity that lies outside the normal range and then you know, alert people about that. So basically one of the things we do in the room is, is we'll use those moments where it's, it's a large amount of, of data or something and visualize it in space. So those, that financial analyst example, we have 100,000 bank transactions visualized in real time uh, on the wall as a sense of overwhelming someone. So it's very hard to make clear of what's happening. And then when we introduce AI into it and Watson starts to uh, prioritize things that you need to investigate first as an analyst, then we use it to basically add clarity and, and use data visualization to say, okay, how does Watson prioritize these things and, and minimize it and help you focus on the things you need to focus on. Um, and that's in a spatial 360 degree space. We partner with a design or a technology group called Oblong, um, mm -hmm. who actually builds the um, proprietary technology we use in the space. So it uses a um, gestural based wand that uses echolocation mm -hmm. to know where you are in a room, as well as then uh, visualizing that stuff in Z space in, you know, basically surround sound, like a shared VR experience. So 
The room is probably, I don't know, 20 feet by 20 feet circular, and we can get about 15 people in there, and we lead them through these experiences that help show this at scale. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because, you know, very often AI and data and like all of these new innovations happening in that space, they're very abstract for a lot of people, right? So I guess like the idea is also to make it tangible for people so they, you know, understand the scope and the impact of, of these topics, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the more abstract something is, the more you have to show it or explain it for someone to, to comprehend it. So that's mm -hmm. exactly what we do. So we'll take these really abstract things or something that sounds like super simple where Watson identifies alerts or prioritizes alerts and then show them actually what the system is doing and how it's doing it. But because it's such you know a complex thing, we can use humans' ability to comprehend spatial information like information on a wall, colors, pictures, to tell that story much more efficiently than we can if we were just trying to explain it with words. Mm -hmm. So how does it usually a project is running in that space? So you, you, I guess you have a brief or you have a new innovation around uh, AI and then you sort of try to understand you know, how to create the story out of that or you know, turn it into a tangible experience? So you know the process is usually uh, a leadership-driven uh, initiative where they're like, you have to do X and mm -hmm. we'll go do X because they asked us to, mm -hmm. or it'll be a, a new emerging product or something that we're hearing from um, the engagement leaders in the space that clients are having trouble with this concept or it's coming up a lot as a, as a discussion point. Mm -hmm. So then we'll, we'll tackle it. That runs the gamut from anywhere of, 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 of a three-month project, which is like a smaller size project, or a six-month project, which is like the large immersive experiences. Mm -hmm. And we kick those off with a, with a week-long kind of deep dive. So we partner with, we call them SMEs, but subject matter experts mm -hmm. who help us understand these complex things. Because even as a expert in the field, we don't necessarily comprehend it entirely. <laughs> so they help us you know, understand it so we can educate others about it. That happens in about a week's time. So the first two days is, is deep dive in the information. And then the rest of the week is spent conceptualizing, storyboarding, workshopping, story beats coming out of that to then start to tell that story. And then by the end of the week, we usually have a, I'll use air quote, demoable uh, experience that we can show to our stakeholders to say, okay, yes or no, or we need to refine this. It's sort of a wireframe animation, yeah. right? Yeah. Or, 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 or I like mean, 360 storyboard, sort of thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. A 360 storyboard. There might be a, a test visualization. Sometimes we even actually throw a drawing mm -hmm. in the, on the 360 degree room yeah. and blow it up. It's more just to have everything outlined as like a storyboard of like, this is exactly the story we're telling. And then we'll go into kind of refining, iterating on it. You know, we'll, we'll focus on specific areas and be like, we need to iterate, expand upon this concept figure out how we can, you know, abstract it enough um, where it's not just, you know, showing a screenshot from a product, but tells that story that one highlights the technology in, in, in an elegant way. So how can we use the 300 degree room in a way that makes sense to use it? So it's not just like a, a technical like feature, it's purposely used. And, and then we'll start combining all those together. And this takes probably, you know, our creative sprints are two weeks. And we'll usually have, you know, maybe four creative sprints until we get to development. And then development is working in conjunction with us creatively to say, take those storyboards and help us spatially create the application. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the advantage of doing something like this in a spatial experience versus uh, VR? I think it's very close to VR, right? If you were to look at it at kind of first glance, they feel the same. I think one of the reasons ours is unique is it's shared. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we can get a number. You can still see each other, right? Yeah. You can still see each other. It's a discussion piece that CEOs or CTOs can, you know, if they see something, they can take it away and it's a shared experience. VR, you have shared experiences, but they're abstracted through your personal perspective. Yeah. So it, it's just a very slight deviation, but not completely different. And, and just for like telling the story to a group of people feels more elegant and less like put these glasses yeah, on yeah, yeah. and sit in a room. Yeah. But you can have very amazing experiences that way too. I mean, earlier today, Karen from Magic Leap was showing some of the stuff that they're doing. And it's really cool because they are focusing on that shared human experience versus just something in your goggles alone. And yeah, I, think I that, mean, they're focusing on AR too, right? Exactly. So it's not VR, right? Yeah, yeah so, so it's like AR, VR, but that shared communal experience, I think is something that's really interesting. And I think that's why our space is very unique and, and why we do it that way. 
Um, there was a, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Eames World Fair design work in 1964. Uh-huh. They designed this thing for IBM, lovingly kind of referred to as the egg, mm-hmm. which was this giant, it looked like almost a electric typewriter ball. But inside that, there were giant screens, uh, probably five feet tall, six feet tall, a number of them spread across the wall. And it was basically the first time humans were really taught about computers at, at scale. Like the you know average mom and pop I think my partner's mother went to the World's Fair yeah. and they found that leading this with a docent or human at the center of the experience is a really important thing because you're teaching other people about this complex thing. It's kind of scary. You want humanity and nurturing involved. Um, and they call it the host guest relationship, which is something that they talked about a lot. Whereas the idea of like, you're not only designing for everything, but you're trying to anticipate everyone's needs. So by leveraging that host guest relationship, you're kind of encouraging that that give and take within the space. And, and that's where we were inspired from to kind of create this shared experience from. It's not just we plucked it out of the air. It actually comes from our ethos, or like our kind of design DNA. Mm-hmm. That's great. What are the different design disciplines you need to incorporate to you know come up or deliver this experience? I mean, it's so wide. The, the breadth of it is so wide and it's kind of everything and nothing, right? It's so I don't even have, I have a fine art background. I studied storytelling and Mm -hmm. filmmaking and you know that was where i started and and i came to this kind of organically Mm -hmm. uh you know the skills that we use i think the most is probably storytelling i hate how often that word is is just kind of thrown around but that's actually kind of the the core of what we do and then a lot of it is visual design um obviously the the ux aspect of it since we do use gestural controls you know, that discipline is involved heavily in, in, in it, content strategy, even just kind of general creative direction. Like, does this make sense for our brand to present it in this way or does it make sense versus this way? So it's kind of like almost every creative kind of enterprise in one, which I think is one of the reasons I'm so attracted to it, is that you get the opportunity to kind of do everything and it really ties all those things together. Yeah, it's super interesting. So you said you studied fine arts. Uh, what was your initial drive to get into uh, the creative space when you were uh, younger? Uh, had to pay bills. Graduated. Um, you know, I went to school in New York, graduated and, and had to pay bills. Um, you know, had to pay back my loan, college loans. Yeah. Uh, had to find a way to do so. And it, I originally started working in children's television as a PA and then a, a, a designer for backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was where my career started. I did that for a few years and then kind of slowly evolved into graphic design at the time. Mm-hmm. It was like table based. CSS was just coming out. So it was very nascent uh, web technology. And, you know, with that nascent technology, it was a lot of opportunities in that space. So I just kind of pivoted over to pursuing more of a, of a design focus than mm-hmm. necessarily, um, you know, animation or storytelling or filmmaking. Um, But then all that stuff kind of came back as I got more into advertising, where it was like, how do you create a commercial? How do you do these things where it's all storytelling? So it was then that kind of culminated in combining storytelling with with visual aesthetics and creating tension and telling a story to now, uh, you know, where it's like kind of combines all that stuff together perfectly there. I didn't never set out with like a very distinct purpose of being like, I'm going to become a designer. It just felt very natural evolution. But I think looking back at my short time in, in children's television, that mm-hmm. I was always more interested in aesthetics and presentation and creating those those artifacts versus creating a, an animated avatar for kids. You know, so it was yeah. just like, it naturally it makes sense because I was just following my, my inclinations versus, um, you know, being a very specific decision to be like, I'm going to do X. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I mean, it's interesting also the the graphic design scene in New York is massive, right? I think one of the you know, most condensed uh, areas where a lot of great graf- graphic design is happening. How do you see the, um, that space evolving in New York? Graphic design and then the trend of user experience and interface design. I mean, there's a link, obviously. Uh, do you see a lot of graphic designer moving on to, to this space? I do. I mean... It's also like the as newer things emerge, I think people are are you know shifting, mm-hmm. especially as as we are moving into more of like a AR VR experiential design mm-hmm. space. Um, you know, I know there's so many amazing um, experiential design shops now in New York. I think that people are combining a lot of their interests and you know their their background too. So a lot of people are coming from a gaming, growing up gaming. 
and then you know being a designer and applying those things together you know you end up in something that that is much more like experiential based or or ar vr or you know any of those things but the graphic design industry in new york is it's overwhelming there's so many design shops um, of amazing pedigree but i mean i see it kind of as a as a constant you know evolution right so even ux if you started out in UX, you may have felt limited. So you started adopting more visual design and, and kind of became a more robust skill set. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were just a visual designer, you felt like you needed to pivot to stay current or relevant. So you started adopting or taking UX classes. I, I just feel like it's a constant conversation and evolution versus Absolutely. You know, one group adopting. to And I think that's the best thing, right? Cross-pollination is the best thing for creativity. So by doing that, I, I think that's amazing. I don't think it's any way good or bad. It's just, I, I think that's the most amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific uh, projects in the past? You uh, specifically had the feeling maybe you could drive impact to your role as a designer or, you know, just some of your, your favorite projects you can uh, talk about? Yeah. I, I mean, there's some of my favorite projects were, were some of the silliest little things, you know, yeah. um, at, at IBM, I would say probably my personally favorite thing because it was just an entirely self-created thing was I, when I first started working with the Watson group was I, I taught Watson to read comic books. Um, so basically by using visual recognition, natural language processing and, and all that technology was able to create this kind of curated cognitive comic experience where you could read a comic, you know, you were reading a comic and uh, you could pull up Watson on your iPad to help identify character trends, uh, maybe even trends in storytelling that we can't see as, as a human going page by page, but using Watson to abstract it, you could say, oh, well, at the beginning of this comic, because the tone is different, uh, the artist is using blue. And then as the tone changes to something more severe, all of a sudden the background colors and all the panels start going orange to red. And, and these are things that storytellers and, and comic creators and artists are doing explicitly in their heads that maybe just totally is over the top of us most of the time. But you know, using something like Watson to abstract that stuff gave us a whole new context in it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of my favorite things. You know, there's been a lot of amazing, amazing projects I've gotten the opportunity to work on, but that was one of my favorite because it was also just like something close to me that I love. I love comic books. So yeah. it was a fun way to explore it. And then when I was in IBM IX, we did a lot of great work with the Masters Golf Tournament. That was uh, something I was very proud of. Uh, and it was like something that, you know, is tangible to people. Like, you know, as a creative, you want to have an artifact to be like, hey, mom and dad, I made this. And that was something they could download on the app store and see that I made and, you know, had a hand in creating. So it was like a proud moment. Every, every project, your favorite for a certain reason. Yeah. You know? yeah it, it's hard to pick your babies out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can never pick your favorite kid, right? Yeah. You can't. You can't. Yeah. You already mentioned IBM IX and IBM. Can you maybe for the audience that might not know the difference? Maybe you could outline that a little bit. Sure. And some of maybe you had two different roles there as well and worked on different topics as well. So right? um, IBM IX is kind of creative agency. So they focus on delivering, you know, creative experiences for clients. Um, and those clients may not be an IBM product client. It could be just a client that they go out and get on their own as a, as a creative agency. So just working in a slightly different space. So at that time, I focused a lot on clients like GM, the Masters app uh, out of uh, Augusta National, the Geico Insurance. You know, there's a lot of clients that, that they do work for that may not be recognized as like an IBM client uh, because they're working in a different space. And then IBM, I work less so client facing, but more on uh, kind of strategic AI services work. So we have business solution, AI business solutions that are like quick to launch things for clients, like how to build a chatbot or how to deploy something with natural language processing. Uh, and these are like little like quick launch um, pre-built assets we create. So leading the teams that do that, as well as leading the design for the um, client experience center. So it's, it's just a slightly different purview where I'm not necessarily focused so much externally. I'm focused more on strategic and, and kind of internal, but still client facing work. Mm -hmm. uh, just so it's, a, I think it has a lot to do with probably who your, your, your business line is and who your profit loss margin line is versus yeah. necessarily who, who that is. But that's a differentiation between IBM and IBM IX is that they're the client agency and they have a lot of really great people there. You know, I've had a lot of friends who, followed me from Ogilvy there and they're a great group. 
Yeah. Are you no in your current role at IBM still work with IBM AX on some projects? Are you still We do. Yeah. We do. Um, you know, specifically as as, you know, maybe our skill set, we don't have, you know, a great writer or we don't have a X, Y, and Z. You know, we can always go to um, IBM IX and be like, hey, do you have any resources or skill sets here mm -hmm. that, that we can that can help us co-deliver this project? And and we do that all the time. What are the things that excite you uh, at the moment working at um, IBM, but also on a broader spectrum uh, on the intersection between design and um, AI? Right now, I, I think the kind of uh, the nascent AI craziness is is kind of starting to coalesce a little bit into something with a little bit more distinction and, and clarity of thought, which I mm -hmm. think is pretty exciting. You know, there's so many people are now having really hard discussions about, you know, ethics of artificial intelligence and, and even the ethics of cloud computing and, and how we need to adapt as designers to thinking about those things, I think is a really hard problem to solve and, and it's very exciting. Just continuing to, to push the boundary in, in how our team creates immersive applications, I think is, is probably the thing that's, that's one of the most exciting things for me is, is just, I mean, I'm such a visually driven person that I want to continually strive to push our group to, to work mm -hmm. harder and harder. And that's probably my biggest motivator is to always just try to best my last one, you know, mm -hmm. always push it better and push it further and make it better. Uh, you were saying um, things are settling a little bit in terms of maybe I, AI was quite a Buzzword maybe a couple of years ago. Can you outline that a little bit? When when AI first started coming out, and and it was more of like a look, we can do this versus we did this look. You know, it, it was it was more of just a like you said, it was like a buzzword. It was a, it was a very nebulous thing, right? It was like oh, we did this with AI. No one necessarily knew what it was. No one knew what neural nets were. Not everyone, but maybe clients or people who were were using these things or experiencing them. And now we're getting much more clarity around this stuff and how our data is used. And, and you know, we've all heard of scandals and all these things that have happened, uh, which I think has motivated a lot of these organizations to start focusing and doing some really great work. I know we have an entire group at IBM focused on AI ethics um, led by Adam Cutler, uh, who's one of our distinguished designers. We have Ruth from Microsoft gave an amazing presentation on on kind of the ethics of AI and, and, and how their team is developing frameworks for, for building with it. And, and I think we're having a lot of smart conversations about it where we're not going to be doing things that are inappropriate or, or maybe not contextually aware of emotional bounds. And I also think products are, are living with us a much longer time now. And there's some talks, I, I think, tomorrow about like um, how do we design for like death and things like that, like when mm -hmm. something happens and, and you have to what does that look like? And it's, it's something that not a lot of people have thought through because we haven't been there and we're now getting there where it's like some products, I mean, Facebook's how old and, mm -hmm. and how old are people on it? And it's constantly changing and evolving and the ethics around these things are, are so complex and, and constantly changing. That I think that that's, as these companies start to identify these teams and they start building these things and companies start working together to be like, hey, you know, this is the right way of doing this and, and this is, we need to do this thing thoughtfully and, and you know intelligently. I think that's the most important thing, right? So that that there's not this like kind of just like uh, haywire, like we're building everything we can. We're just gonna grab a bunch of images off of Flickr with no one's permissions and feed them into visual recognition algorithms. Like all that stuff is going away, and now things are being done with much more clarity. But yeah, I think that that's probably what I was you know trying to explain a bit was like that that stuff's like coming to fruition now from what was like the wild west of, of AI. Anyone could do anything and they did it and now we're like, we shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And I think designers that are driving that conversation, which I think is the most amazing thing. When it comes to you know making um, these kind of innovations tangible for people, um, and there's also the side of using AI or data as a tool for design in terms of, you know, I'm speaking of generative design and kind of these kind of topics. I wonder if this is also something you try to leverage or is there, you, see, you see opportunities to leverage this if you, for example, need to explain a certain kind of you know, data asset or a certain kind of innovation. Is there, does it also enable you different kind of tools or different kind of methods uh, in terms of visualizing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I um, gave a talk at my niece's middle school career day about okay. what I do. Uh, and aside from none of them knowing what I do uh, and really understanding it, 
um, was I actually, with the school's permission, I fed their middle school Twitter feed into Watson to start to get uh, concepts and ideas out of it and use that as as our seeds for kind of like creating some generative art with them about like, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) using it to, you know, this color signifies this and this color signifies that. Georgia Lupi uh, was presenting earlier today and basically the same thing. You know, it's it's just like creating data stories. Um, It gives you those seeds in a really nice and elegant manner. And we do that a lot. In an unofficial capacity, we kind of will create specially kind of bespoke wall art for clients when they come into the center. And we do that using Watson and, and processing and the hype framework from Josh Davis and, and, you know, using that to create generative poster art for our clients when they come into the center is just like a, you know, storytelling device, but absolutely. And, and that's a quick way for us to experiment with data too, um, is, is we'll get data and we'll, we'll actually just start visualizing it and processing to see what we can do and, and what is possible versus, Um, you know, spending a lot of time trying to comprehend it. Like it gets us to that point faster. What are some of the design principles you maybe um, learned to all your years uh, working on that intersection? So I'd say, you know, number one is it's probably show, don't just do. Um, So that means you have to show how you got to something, why you got to something, why an AI system made a decision it did. And it also allows the user to, to say why it's wrong and kind of, in conjunction with that is you have to know your data. Uh, that's something that's hard for designers, right? We have to yeah, comprehend right. something that, that's massive and complex and, and, and you have to know it because if you don't, you're not going to get to the experience you need to get to. You know, I work kind of collaboratively with data scientists and, and with you know, our, our AI engineers and, and that's been the, I would say, the biggest blessing of my role is that I've had access to these folks who can actually educate me uh, very clearly about our data and what we're doing with it and, and why we're getting certain things out of it. So knowing that data is super important. And then, you know, you have to design for honesty and, and not being omnipotent. So this almost works hand in hand with data and, and being transparent, but you know, an AI system doesn't know what it doesn't know. So you have to be clear that this is something that is not built for it or it doesn't understand it and it can't do it. and you know, you need to be honest in your design and not try to like hide it because it, it, it's not the right way to do it. Your system is not all knowing, it will fail. AI always fails. So you have to decide how to make it fail elegantly. Something that makes me crazy uh, is that, you know, using AI, you're not just gonna be like, oh, here's a chart, you know, here's a visualization about what the system is doing. And sometimes, you know, we love to create artifacts and we love to create things, but sometimes your, your biggest role is delivering an insight versus necessarily delivering an artifact. Um, so, you know, that's the thing you have to keep in mind. It's not necessarily how pretty a chart is or how great it works or how great it is responsively, or, you know, if it's the right time to show a chart or not, it's more like, what is your, what is your user trying to get or glean from this information versus how you present it? And I think that's one of the most important things that designers have to do, especially now as we're dealing with, you know, the, the, the heaps of data that we're creating every day, it's going to get more and more complex. And then the last one is, is always in service of people and never in lieu of them. You know, as AI systems evolve and change, we're going to have to have hard conversations about what they're doing and how they're impacting people's lives and, you know, ability to, you know, make a living and, and provide for their families and things like that. So, you know, we need to be cognitive that we're not displacing people or putting them out of work or, or things like that. What we create needs to help people and basically scale knowledge versus become uh, something to out, you know, outsource people or, or get rid of people with. Personally, I don't, that's not, probably not an IBM. Um, I don't know what their perspective is, but that's just my personal perspective is that mm-hmm. we have to always be representative of people versus not getting rid of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk these days about the responsibility uh, of designers when crafting experiences uh, with AI, right? This kind of aspect of responsibility, is that also part of the, the conversation or something you, you had the chance to, to touch on maybe in some of the visualizations or storyboards you did? When we first launched Watson, um, you know, it was kind of very nascent times, right? And, and maybe some of the creative teams weren't as responsible as they should have been when presenting that information. And how our group works now in response to that is everything we create is running with real data. Everything is built and running in real time or it's built using real data that's cached just due mm-hmm. to performance reasons. Yeah. Versus showing something that was essentially like a 290 degree room movie 
it's now a 290 degree room uh, application that responds to you and is stateful um, in real time. I think that that's a good demonstration of, of a designer being responsible for what we're creating because yeah. we have to say, this is not right. We have to do it this way and speak up about it and be empowered to do so. So fortunately, you know, my boss empowers my entire group to, to have these conversations where we're like, hey, we need to go this way versus maybe something that was a little bit more of emotional blackmail before or something like that. Like we're telling stories that are, are real and, and telling them responsibly versus maybe stretching the truth or going again, you know, outside the bounds. We're, we're being very explicit in how we, how we show stuff. And I think that that's true for, for all of AI now, right? So it was, it was kind of very uh, wishy-washy and hazy about what it was. And, and, you know, people have gotten a lot more responsible and, or hopefully are getting more responsible in how they, you know, present these things and, and create these experiences. Actually, when you, when you craft these experiences, do you always know your audience when you craft? The audience might change, right? Sometimes you have a designer in there. Sometimes you have a, maybe a business stakeholder, right? And do you, I just wonder, you know, how to, your experience on creating stories for either a tailored audience or like like an audience you you might can't predict right it's a good question you know in the centers we have anything you know we run the gamut from a ceo who is very strategic but may not know very specifically about you know ai technology or we have a cto or we may even have like a high level engineer who are on the ground and know everything and, and call bullshit on us basically. So we have to be able to talk to everyone, not just um, technical you know, genius, but also like the Luddite. Like we have to have enough information that they leave the room, the CEO leaves the room with an understanding of what it is. I'm not saying every CEO doesn't understand this, but that's just a vernacular we use, um, that the CEO can leave the room understanding what this is but the CTO uh, can leave the room understanding why he needs to do these things. And we do that through um, kind of like allowing our engagement leaders to be reactive to the audience. So when we create these stories, we create scripts and story flows for them. Um, and in some of these, we have like an alternate route, right? So we'll have like, oh, you could choose this one if you feel like the audience is more technically oriented. Or you could go this way if you feel like it's more high level and just a strategic story. It's almost like that in gaming when you create a decision tree to, to you know, kind of yeah. create that story. It's the same process for what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were touching a little bit on, on prototyping already, but, you know, I can imagine it, you know, it's very crucial because if you start to, you know, go into the end of the visualization, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, resources to, you know, you know finalize this. So you need to get there iteratively. Uh, what is your learnings when it comes to, you know, prototyping AI experience or communications of uh, AI experiences? I think prototyping is central to everything. Our prototyping could be as simple as, as a drawing. It's just like, I think this might work. And even with AI, it's incredibly important that you're doing this because if you're, if you're visualizing data or something using AI you're not entirely sure what it's going to look like. There's all these variables and all these things where yeah. you, you're just setting up the guide rails. Yeah, you're right? creating the framework, right? But yeah. the content comes from somewhere else. And like so. it's going to be like completely off the rails. So you're just like try, trying to set up the sandbox for it to play in. Um, and it's, you know, rules and, and you know, kind of like decision-making rules and, and like, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, visualize this if it goes this way versus this way. But yeah, prototyping is absolutely central to that because that's the best way to identify one early on if if you're going to have at least some sort of problem so even if we're not visualizing the exact thing we're trying to understand what the trends in the data are so that we can then understand what those trends might look like in our experience and we do that all via prototyping uh, and that's usually done with using real-time data in processing or you know even just sketching stuff or having you know some of our engineers build out like an actual just something on the wall for us to look at Or it could be, you know, we just have a drawing that we put at the wall and see what it's going to feel like at space. And that is central because that, that's usually where we actually find a unique thing we didn't anticipate happening. Or, or it reacts, or the AI system is reacting differently than we had thought it would. I mean, it's crucial. It, it's probably one of the most important things that we do. And, and, and I think the other thing is that, like, just prototyping as fast as possible. And I, that's why I always fall back to drawing because I can draw faster than I can do anything and... If I want to try to do something in processing, it takes me way longer, but I'll have a drawing and then I can be like, I want to go here. Um, and that usually is like the creative stimulus for where we want to get to. You know, we'll do a bunch of different drawings. And even, you know, when we're concepting these things, 
we're just generating as much volume of ideas as we can. And that's really what prototyping is, right? It's just yeah. generating volume of ideas. I mean, it's a topic that comes over and over in the podcast when it comes to like the, the impact design can deliver that this ability of quickly visualizing knowledge, ideas or insights is something really unique about, I think, the role of de designers to be able to quickly show this. And then you can show it to other stakeholders, right? And uh, you can you know, take them along and uh, convince them maybe for a certain path to go. I had mentioned something in my talk earlier where I was like, made a glib comment about that I think toolkits are dead, design toolkits. Um, and then someone poked me on in the audience. It was like, well, you know, IBM has, you know, IBM design thinking and IBM design language. And I was like, I think those are two different things. I was like, when I was specifically referencing toolkits, it was like those, I don't know, download this prototyping toolkit and prototype X faster. And like, I think that stuff is just stupid. IBM does design thinking and, you know, even IDEO and, and, you know, all these consultant agency who have these, these basically almost all the same thing for design thinking, but it's just scaling it, right? So you hit on a very uh, important point where it's like, I would say 95% of our stakeholders are not creative people and they don't have the creative forethought to be able to picture something like the way we do, where naturally and intrinsically we can think about an abstract concept and, and think about in our heads. Mm -hmm. And that's what IBM design thinking is, is fantastic at. And what all these frameworks are fantastic at is that it helps to enable a, maybe someone who didn't go to, you know, art school or maybe doesn't have a creative agency background or, or, you know, a UX design background to, to start to actually be part of the process first to have ownership of it and two to help co-deliver it they that person may not have a creative background but it doesn't you know doesn't say their ideas are bad it's a toolkit for them to come to the table with first prototyping toolkit that you download for your sketch that helps you prototype 10 times faster where you can just do it piece of paper and it's boxes and stuff like i, I think it's that part of of design thinking and and, and helping non-creative people be part of the process and also help visualize stuff is probably one of the most important things for you know design in the business world because it, it, it enables your stakeholders to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Before it was more like you went off and played art school and you came back with ideas and these things where now if you co-create these things with leadership and, and with folks who maybe didn't have a voice in that process before, it enables you to get to that end product so much faster. Mm -hmm. Now it's a good, I think, a nice reference you did there when it comes to, you know, either you, you can do it on your own, right? Um, you know, craft something on your own, then go to the business people and then, you know, get their feedback. Well, if you, you know, were collaborative and you know, co-design it, um, obviously you take them along and uh, obviously it gives you also more responsibility in the whole process, right? And more involvement. So I think this is, this is uh, super interesting. I think these two, two sides. And I think, you know, there's, there's always these conversations about whether design thinking is good or bad or, you know, you see these medium articles about it or whatever. And it's just like, I think it's just the wrong conversation. It's not yeah. whether it's good or bad. It's just, it's an additional toolkit. You know, it's an additional tool in your kit of things as a designer that, that you can use to help create these experiences. That's essentially what it is. It's a framework for creation. Mm -hmm. Less of someone else taking your job away. Yeah. Which I think is what some people are afraid of. Looking a little bit into the future, uh, I mean, you work in quite a progressive field with, you know, when it comes to AI, etc. Where do you see interaction design going? Or I mean, it's a tough question. I feel like... I'm probably going to say the same thing as, as everyone else, but I mean, I think the, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's going to be entirely gestural and in space versus, you know, screen-based and, and, you know, web design and things like that. And, and everyone's saying that, and I, that's where it's going to go. I just, I don't know if it's going to be in the way we expect it to, right? I don't know if it's how it's going to happen, but there's going to be an innovation that allows us to almost untether ourselves from like goggles and, and things like that, um, you know, holograms or i mean i don't know but i think that there's going to be an innovation that obviously i will not create uh that will allow us that freedom to really break free and and you know combine all these emerging skill sets like voice interaction and and even voice psychology and 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 you know speech interaction psychology and and you know non-screen based interaction and spatial design into this kind of new nebulous thing that and i That's where I feel like it's going to go and then add AI into that. It, it's almost like I, I can't even comprehend it because I can't. You asked me when I started my career, uh, you know, would I be designing spatial applications with AI? I probably would have just like looked at you and, and blinked a bunch of times because none of those words made any sense to me. 
I think it's going to be the same thing in five years. It's just like the industry is iterating and, and mm -hmm. changing so quickly that it's, it's, you almost have to just be constantly adapting to new things. And I think that it's just going to be, we have to continue to iterate and adopt mm -hmm. and scale new technologies as quickly as possible. And, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations in the past, but also these days about the, the role of design and the impact um, of design in business. I think you were touching on this, um, you know, considering the, maybe the technology innovations that are, might happen. What do you think is the role of design in regards of that, uh, the, the impact it could drive? Design's impact will always be driven by creative's abilities to think abstractly. You know, a designer can take something that, that may be uh, already in the world as something and abstract it into something else that's completely different in a new way. A lot of people can, but I think designers are uniquely set to do this just because of our skill set and our backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's probably where our role will be, and I don't know what that necessarily comes as, but I, I think it's just our ability to take existing things and continually, um, you know, adapt them. And then, you know, also hopefully have a voice to impact uh, and be involved in, in kind of nascent early stage technologies. Like you, you hear designers being more involved in those things now. And I think it would just, it, it will continue to be that, you know, having not design at the table, but that voice of reason almost yeah, uh, involved yeah. is, is I think something that's going to be really important too. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all these insights. It's been amazing to get insights about uh, what you're doing and uh, your learnings about AI. So uh, I think we need to wrap it up because of time, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you for having me and uh, thank you. That was the episode. If you want to give us feedback on the podcast, have something to contribute to the next episode, or just want to get in touch, feel free to connect with us either on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram messages, or simply via the designdrives.org website. We love to hear from you.